Hi and welcome to uh, another episode of the Skeptical Leftist Podcast. In this one, I've got an interview with Jeff Thomas Black, um, host and writer of The Full Dash Closure, a book and blog and podcast about the DoorDash and AI and how it's impacting our, our world. And uh, I have quite a bit of personal experience with the gig app or the gig economy. I thought I would uh, do a little bit of a, a discussion about it before taking you into the interview. Um, uh, so some of my stuff, some of the things I know are very specific to like our region, like Regina, Saskatchewan just got uber in 2019 we had uh, an app called skip the dishes for those who are outside of the country uh out of south of canada you might not know what that is but skip the dishes is basically uh doordash um in, in a lot of ways it, it's it's like doordash it, they deliver food they go you know you pick it up at the restaurant you get your notification you pick it up at the restaurant and you drive it to uh the person who ordered it um in 2019 in may i got a new car and at the same time, um, a buddy of mine said that Uber was coming to town. So we thought we would try it out. And the first, I think it was first month, maybe, uh, there was a guaranteed minimum of $20 an hour as long as you were logged into the app. Um, so that was pretty handy, especially I was I needed to move. I was going through a, a separation, a, a breakup at the time, and, uh, and uh, needed the money to put a deposit on a new place and it was it was quite helpful um but it was interesting because you could see like for uh, those of us who started at the beginning when it first came into our city uh we made 20 dollars an hour guaranteed no matter how many passengers we got and we imagined that it would stay pretty similar because then the app would become part of like it would be well known that this was in our city and then that would mean that there was lots of customer but that didn't really pan out at first it did because after the first month then for like two or three months after that it was still very busy there wasn't a lot of drivers so then when you wanted to work you could make money uh which i did i i, I worked like whenever i wasn't at my other job i was in my car doing driving people for uber and when i felt like i wasn't busy enough then i would sign up for shifts for skip the dishes in december of 2019 uh doordash came to our city it might have been a little bit before that but i signed up in in december and at the same time i signed up for instacart because i was making pretty decent money on my days off doing various gig apps and it seemed like this was the way to make x get ahead like but at the, also i was grinding it out like i was never not working uh 24 hours a day seven days a week uh, I would go to my job at uh, at the waste water facility in uh, and so I would drive an hour and 45 to go to work. I would drive an hour and 45 to come back to Regina and I would get in. I would shower, wash the car and get out there and do Uber or uh, DoorDash or what have you. Skip the dishes for three or four hours before I crashed, got a couple hours of sleep, went to work the next day, did it over again. <clears throat> and I did that straight through for a number of months uh, um actually in december when doordash came up actually that's when i started to slow down because i i i just it was unsustainable <laughs> like you cannot actually work 24 hours a day seven days a week without eventually just getting so tired that you don't wake up when the alert comes um and that's what happened a lot of the time uh so my rating started going down when I, in Uber. So I had to kind of pull back a little bit. But then in uh, March of 2020, when COVID hit and the oil price was very low, I got laid off. So then for the next couple months, the way that I was surviving, as, as well as we got the CERB, I, I made sure that I was making underneath the certain amount of money, however much you could make per, uh, per pay period. I would go and I would do DoorDash and I would do Uber and I would... Uh, do various gig apps. But then uh, near, uh, I'd say, I think it was October of 2020, <clears throat> I, I did go back to work at some point. And so then I kind of was doing both again, trying to make sure that my family was fed because uh, my partner still was not able to work uh, due to various restrictions on uh, uh, her visa, her work visa, uh, because she's not uh, from Canada. Um, and then... I got, I, I, they, my job 
wanted me to work at a facility with a schedule that I did not want to work at. And uh, I didn't want to work at that facility. I don't like that facility. It's it's not the place I'd wa- like to be. And the schedule was no good for me. Uh, so then I, I, I told them I quit. I gave them my notice and I went and I did gig work for like exclusively for six months ish uh, from October till about March of the next year, 2021. And it, you, unless you live that life, it's very hard to explain to someone how much you're working without actually making any money. Uh, You're in your car at least 18 hours a day. You have to be available and on call and in a quote unquote hot spot for the available time that you're on shift. Um, it, it, there's a couple, there's a couple things I'm missing here because like, uh, I don't know if this is how it was everywhere, but on, in our region, in our city on DoorDash, you had to sign in and schedule shifts. I know that in other places, people said that you can just sign on, but there was not any that you couldn't do that unless you were a top dasher, a quote unquote top dasher in our area. So I had to schedule shifts at some point. If you deliver enough, then you get preferential scheduling. So you would be able to schedule two day a day before everybody else or two days before everybody else. But if you didn't have that, which I didn't because I was trying to do that in between my work when I was still kind of tenuously working. And uh, so then I had to wake up at 3.30 in the morning, the day of the schedule release, excuse me, so that I could schedule my shift for seven days from now. So every single day I had to wake up at 3.30 in the morning, schedule one week in advance for a shift to work (laughs) for DoorDash. Uh, Uber, you could still turn it on whenever you wanted. Uh, skip the dishes you had to schedule and DoorDash you had to schedule. Instacart you could kind of schedule but also kind of do whatever you wanted. It, it, it was kind of a mix. I eventually did like when I was laid off again or when I quit my job I was doing I, I was a quote unquote top dasher uh, because I keep doing quotes because it's nonsense. It's a top dasher. It's just a guy who works way more than everybody else <laughs> like so that you get good ratings and you, you know, you deliver your food on time and you, whatever. But the thing is like, even, and we talk about this in the interview, even if you have a top dasher rating and you technically are supposed to have priority, uh, over other people for orders, I was still sitting in my, in a parking lot near my home that said it was a hot spot that said that I had top dasher status. And I was still doing that many hours of the day. Until finally I was like, well, I got fed up and I would go and I would take an Instacart order. I would, you know, I would do two apps at the same time so that if I'm not getting enough DoorDash orders, then I would be on Uber and I would be waiting for a passenger. And so you're multi-apping. You have to, you have to turn off one app when you're doing a delivery for the other one. And a couple of times I got caught, like where I ended up having two orders at the same time on different apps. And so then you're rushing to deliver one and go pick up the other one and drop it off before you get another order. It, it was very stressful. Um, and like I say, and it wasn't enough, and it wasn't enough money to live on actually. Like I estimated that I think I needed to let make at least $150 a day in order for us to survive. So, I mean, I did what I had to so that I, that would work. But I, I, <laughs> if I hadn't supplemented it with income from uh, an extra side job that I was doing for uh, my dad, I don't think that it would have worked. I don't think it would have been possible. And I know that I'm kind of rambling on, giving my personal history a little bit here, but this is something that I I, um, I have a lot of experience with. I, I know six months doesn't sound like a lot, but I... I had it gamed, like I had it as gamed as you can have it in my city. And so then I would be doing Instacart when I didn't have, when I was down, I was doing Uber. I was, you know, I'm scrolling through apps, always checking, making sure I'm not missing notifications, making sure I'm logged in, making sure I'm in the most recent hotspot, making sure that I don't burn a lot of fuel without paying for it, right? It's, (laughs) you're never turned off. It's, it's so stressful. It's the most absurd system. And I don't, I didn't know at the time how backwards the AI was, the algorithm. Like I always assumed that it was like, okay, it's supposed to send the order to the guy who's nearest to the restaurant with the best rating or what have you. Right. But you could have two guys, two drivers with the same status. You could have two drivers with the same, 
uh, rating, the same number, almost the same identical number of orders, identical in every way, two feet away from each other. One guy will be getting orders all day and the other guy will be getting nothing. And eventually it got to the point where like, uh, I had to quit, skip the dishes because it insisted on sending me across the city to pick up orders, uh, that we're only paying for the short delivery. Cause you don't get paid for your drive to the restaurant. You get paid for your drive from the restaurant to the customer. So if it wants you to go 15 kilometers to the edge of the city and then pick up the, to a restaurant down in the south end of the city, pick up, uh, pick up the order and drive three minutes to the delivery. That's a $3 order, right? Like that's, it's nothing. You don't get paid hardly anything and nobody tips on these things. It's, and I, I know that, and maybe, uh, Maybe tipping isn't the right way to solve this problem. Obviously, it's not because you should be on a wage system and you should be getting a fair pay for fair work. Uh, but without tips, there was no way to make money on this. Like, <laughs> so, so it got frustrating to deliver orders like that that are very expensive meals. Uh, and you know that you're picking it up at a fancy ass restaurant and delivering it to a, ha- a fancy ass hotel room and you get no tip at all. And it's frustrating. I, I feel for the guys that are doing it. I, I, I had to quit myself because it's, it's a, a lost cause. And, and then eventually the, the market gets, uh, filled up. You're re, you're, cause there's no limit on how many drivers they allow for these apps. So then there's thousands or hundreds of drivers, depending on your area. And you could just like say, like I had every app that was available in my city. And there was times when I was sitting for an hour and a half with nothing. And I would just go home and I would be like, well, fuck it. Like I might as well work on my podcast. (laughs) So that's kind of when I started this show. Well, that's when I spent a lot of time invested in this show anyway, but I've kind of gone on long enough. I really didn't want to go on this long. Uh, talking about myself and my personal history with DoorDash. Uh, but it seems really relevant because that's w- literally what the interview is about. Um, all right. So on to the pitch. My family and I are moving. So production uh, is less steady than it has been. Uh, and it's going to get even worse for a little while. Uh, but I hope that everybody's okay with that. And like I've said before, uh, now is a better time to support this show than ever at any other time because my rent just went up by $700 a month and I can definitely use the help. So if you can help uh, financially and want to contribute, that's patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. You can also contribute at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty or uh, on the website, on my website, skepticalleftist.com. There's a space where you can contribute at like, you can give me money. There's lots of places to give me money. <laughs> Um, so thank you to all the patrons who have, uh, contributed over the last uh, few months. And thank you to everybody who sent one-time donations. I really appreciate it. Um, you all make it possible for me to do this show. Um, support levels on Patreon start at $1 per month or $1.50 for Canadians. If you can't support me with money, um, then please hit the like button or go and write a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser or one of the other podcast rating services. Um, I think you can give us five stars on Spotify now, uh, which is another place you can give me money if you subscribe on Spotify. Uh, for 99 cents a month, you'll get the bonus content, the same as Patreon. Um, plus if you use the Spotify app, you can actually get video podcast. So that's always cool. Um, yeah. So I always need more ratings and reviews. Uh, so make sure to check out the links in the show notes for that and and make sure to subscribe on YouTube or the podcast app of your choice so that you get new episodes as soon as they come out. Feel free to contact me on social media, uh, leave a comment on YouTube, or you can contact me on my website, skepticalleftist.com. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thank you so much for being here, and on to the interview. All right. Hi, and welcome to the Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Jeff Thomas Black, uh, author of The Full Dash Closure and uh, host of the podcast as well. Thanks for joining me. My pleasure, Corey. Thanks for inviting me. I've been looking forward to it. For sure. It's, uh, I've been following you for a little while. I think, I think when I started following you, you had fewer followers than I do. And now you have roughly 10 times as many followers as I do. (laughs) It's, it's growing. Uh, 
timing is everything. This is some combination of bad timing and good timing. It's bad timing in that uh, I get to live through this in my lifetime as as you do. It's good timing in that for the last three years, I've been working on this project mm-hmm. of the gig economy first as a, as a participant, as a laborer in the gig economy for a couple of years, as I learned and, and processed what it was like to be employed and directed by AI. And that was a real, that was a real trip. And, and interestingly enough, people say, well, you did 5,521 deliveries. Why did you do it if it was exploiting you? Well, I did it for the same reasons everyone else does it. <laughs> I got to pay bills. <laughs> it was a pandemic and I was desperate and there was no other opportunities. But, <laughs> yeah. I also, but I also did it and I kept doing it because I knew there was a bigger story there than what I was being told. I knew from day one I was being deceived and used, but I didn't quite know how. And unfortunately, right. over the last year since I since I quit, the uh, labor aspect of the gig economy and went into the research aspect of the gig economy, I learned about artificial intelligence and the systemic way in which the gig economy is enslaving humanity, not just for the gig economy, that's an entry point, but for the rest of our time (laughs) as laborers to the system. And the system will no longer be evil corporations directed by boards of directors those folks will all be completely immaterial. The system will just be corporate shells running AI programs that own and direct us in totality. So it's it's truly a scary time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't sound very. It, it sounds a little bleak. <laughs> it doesn't sound good. It does it? Does I was really worried about that. It's very difficult to introduce a book or a work or a concept that's going to challenge everything that people know about their existence, their perception of work, their perception of income, their perception of time, their perception of reality. Because one of the keys, the big key of AI is that it tricks our human perceptions into believing there's some anthropomorphized character Mm. out there that is directing us in a way we can comprehend. Uh, there is no anthropomorphized <laughs> character. This is just a, a con- yeah. conglomeration of, of algorithms put together by the most genius data scientists and systems developers on the planet to exploit you. Yeah, it's so so. Everything that we know and we perceive as human beings is being disrupted, and it's being disrupted not for let's say the wealthy, not for the comfortable middle class, maybe not even for the comfortable lower working class, but for the most desperate and deceived and exploited workforce Mm -hmm. in the world today, as has always been, which is people of color, women, people that are disenfranchised from the workforce, people already living in poverty and desperation where they don't have as many choices. So the, the hideousness of this scheme that will creep from this bottom up into now you see with chat GPT and the, the higher level right. AI development, it's going to creep up into this, into this working class and middle class. Uh, and, you know, that progression is happening extraordinarily quickly. So to my surprise, to some extent, this, this new paradigm has converged with, with the completion of my book and my work to uh, be a real humdinger. Uh, but not in a good way because I have two adult <laughs> children that I'd like to live their full lifespans, and I think this puts that severely at risk. Yeah, it's a, it's an odd time. I I I also worked gig work during the pandemic. Like I, uh, and then oh, you did wow, and then I did uh, for like I don't know for six months because the company I worked for they wanted to put me on a schedule I couldn't deal with. I worked gig work for about six months uh, for that, and uh, so. I have a personal stake in how bad this actually is. Mm-hmm. Uh, at first, it seemed okay because you get lots of deliveries or lots of trips. If you're doing Uber, you get lots of uh, lots of good opportunities, it feels like. But then as you go, you start to realize, well, I'm spending more and more time sitting in a parking lot doing nothing, and I can't contact anybody to see what the hell's going on and why I haven't had a delivery in two hours. I, <laughs> so it's very, it's very like, 
Yeah, it's very like you're stuck just thinking like, am I doing something wrong? How do I survive if I don't get a delivery suit? Right. And there is, there's no anybody to contact. Right, right. right? So, <laughs> so even that is an illusion when you're working for, for AI because there's, so there's two complementary impossibility scenarios for AI. One, and, and it's particularly called black box AI because the output that comes out of it is completely a product of a process that is number one, unexplainable mm -hmm. by definition and for humanity. And number two, ununderstandable, even if you could explain it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a real big problem for humanity to turn our uh, economic sovereignty over to a figure that becomes essentially the the oracle, the god of our little uh, app world, and that's why that's why it becomes app slavery. Is right. that we become trapped in this new vortex that is not organic. It's not the real world. We just act like it is, and it moves us around like playing pieces in the real world. But it's not the real world. So that's the that's the challenge. Is that when the when the cognitive dissonance comes. There's no, there's no answer to that cognitive distance. That cognitive <laughs> right. distance is very rational in this term. Like, you don't know. You'll never know. Yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that always got me was the hot spots. Oh. <laughs> hot spot, right. You, go, you drive from hot spot to hot spot, and then you sit there for 30 minutes, and the hot spot disappears, and another one pops up over there. So you drive over to that one. Very so what's like, so Corey, let's let's. This is a great example. Tell me what a hot spot is. Define a hot spot ah, for the audience. Yes, a hot spot is supposedly a spot that is in where everybody. Uh, there are lots of deliveries within the area of this location, supposedly. But you will yeah. often, <laughs> yeah, drive right. there and not get any. <laughs> so let's 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 imagine a scenario where you and I are both on the clock for for one of these gig app companies. Let's call it DoorDash. So we're Fair. both on the clock for. DoorDash, and we're in the same parking lot right now, we will not have the same hotspots necessarily on our screen. Right. Because those hotspots are not organic hotspots of busy humans in real time. Right. Those are, number one, simulated hotspots predicting human activity in real time, if they're that. Because since you and I don't have the same ones, we can actually surmise that it's a way for the AI to move me where it wants me to go, whether it's to cool my heels or get lots of work. And then right. it moves you where it wants you to go, either to cool your heels or get lots of work. So yeah. this, is, this is the problem that I would say 99% you know, of the people still participating in gig apps don't understand is that they're being gamed not a little bit. They're being gamed totally, in totality. Right. They are being yeah. served up a world that they believe they understand, that they believe is relevant to where they sit, to what they do, to the to maybe even some choices that they make within the app. None of that's the case. None right. of that's the case. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what do they say? Like the mouse that makes a certain choice or, or what have you and thinks, okay, well, that, that choice leads to this outcome. But right. That's not what actually happens because you can make that choice a hundred times and that's not what led to that outcome. Right. So, so 15 restaurants and 15 drivers gives us 15 to the 15th power uh, options for deliveries, which is over a trillion options. <laughs> so anybody out there delivering in a community that has more than 15 restaurants and more than 15 drivers must know that they can't comprehend the number of combinations and yeah. ways that they could be sent to job. <laughs> yeah. Not only yeah. can they not understand it numerically, logically, but the system isn't logical. Within the system of DoorDash, the AI has the ability to slow the system down or speed the system up. It controls both the supply and the demand of labor. Right. So it controls how many ways this pie this economic pie is going to be divided up by a thousand drivers or a thousand and two drivers or a thousand five hundred drivers. That's all. That is not part of a market. That's all determined by the AI, whether they call more in or whether they whether they let more off. Now, they don't even have to call more in or let more off. 
they can just increase the distance to the restaurants that they put out to yeah. the drivers. Yeah. So they can just they can just make it take 60 seconds long systemically for every driver to get to their route. Right. <laughs> Again, you know, this is the power of an omnipotent God over <laughs> a human workforce. It's hideous. It's hideous. Yeah. When you really realize, when you understand what's going on, you will scream out loud. And if you don't, we need to talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all like, uh... It wasn't DoorDash, but there was another app that I, I worked because I, I did four apps at the same time <laughs> in order to make a living. And you didn't one kill of, yourself or anybody else while you were doing it either. No, huh? no, that's right. Well but whenever somebody asked me, should I do this? Should I go into Uber or should I do DoorDash? I said, well, you can survive, but you have to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to work. And, and that's how you survive. Just, just to survive, not to thrive, not to get enough money to like, pay your taxes just to survive. Yeah. <laughs> and the costs, including oh, yeah. the risk that you're taking to do that, while you believe you're doing enough to survive, you may or may not actually get there. Because one of these, one of the most insidious things about the gig economy, the concept of the gig economy, is it's a, it's, it's a transfer of both capital investment requirements and risk from corporations to not only labor, but to impoverished labor and desperate labor. So let's let's do that again. So the risk of anything, the risk of time delays, the risk of traffic, the risk of restaurant delays, the risk yeah. of a uh, customer being unavailable, the risk of your car breaking down, the risk of you blowing your head gasket, all of those things, those are on you. There's no corporate fleet that is yeah. being managed here. Those are now on the impoverished workers who you can bet are probably not driving 2022 BMWs. They're, they're <laughs> driving a car that might need a little bit more work yeah. than that. In two years of doing this, 5,521 precisely uh, deliveries, and I never used any other gig app than DoorDash uh, okay. by design because, because I wanted to understand this one very completely. And it's at a 65% current market share. It's the gorilla. Right. You want to focus, focus on the gorilla. Yeah. In that time, 40,000 miles on my car. Yeah. 40,000 miles I did. Now, I, uh, my coup de gras, one of my, I'd say one of my last two weeks of driving, it was about 102 degrees here in Indiana. And I, uh, my, my water pump and timing belt blew. Now, that's a, that's, that's a $2,000. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and it puts oh, you out of commission, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, well, that's two thousand dollar repair in the old world. In the new world, you can't get your Volkswagen uh, Passat been looked at for three and a half weeks in Bloomington, Indiana. Oh, geez, yeah. So, wow. so, so subtract two thousand dollars from your bank account if you have it or not, right. and then you're off work for at least three and a half to four weeks just for them to look at your car and fix it. Yeah. So that transfer of risk from corporations to individuals is purely toxic, right? It's, it is unsustainable, as is the entire gig economy. And we'll get into that. Why are they doing it if it's unsustainable? Because <laughs> that's that's the operative question. A good question. Yeah, it's a very yeah. good question. I, how has, or I, may, I don't know, maybe you know this, has how has the AI uh, or the app AI evolved since the original gig economy started? Really good question. It's just, I, I noticed, like I did, I used to notice because I did this when like Uber was brand new in my city, and it seemed like every week there's a new update to the app, the the Uber driver app, right. and every week there's a new. Like, okay, so now I'm sitting in places longer. Now I'm, you know, they're, they're always putting out promotions to get new drivers. So then you're always losing the demand or spreading it more thinly. And it seemed like the app, like it would, one week it would have a contact help button and the next week it wouldn't. And the next, in the, and then suddenly it would be like, oh, uh, you can push this button for, you know, safety features. But 
then it doesn't work the next week. <laughs> so I'm curious, like how the apps and how the evolution of the the whole thing kind of, how has that really gone? I, I number one, for anybody that's been doing it. So, so again, I started pretty much during the height of the pandemic after the after the total lockdowns were were lifted. For anybody that's been looking at this market over the last three years, there's been a race to the bottom in terms of in terms of how much income after expenses, the net income that gig workers have been have been getting out of this. So yeah, yeah. people that were once making maybe enough to really get by are now coughing up blood and using five different apps to try and cull together <laughs> income. Yeah, right? yeah. So so that's what you talked about. They call in the in the gig economy uh, worker space. They call that multi apping. Yes. So in in the early days, I think people could attach themselves to a single gig app, pay attention to that gig app, time what the patterns are, and call something together. And as there's been this race to the bottom with the net income that these gig apps have been providing, as more labor has become available in the space, and that's the other, you know, they, they have more desperate labor to uh, exploit. Yeah. Now, yeah. so there's more exploitative, exploitable labor now than ever. So combine those two things with a higher supply of, of exploitable labor, and then the ability once they have that exploitable labor involved, there becomes a couple things. There becomes the the status quo bias, even if it's heinous and abusive and slavery, people get used to it. People get yep, used to yep. gratuitous convenience and they get attached to a schedule of seven day a week flexibility over a nine to five. And and so there's many, many reasons that that this market has expanded. But but most importantly, it's because these apps are insidious. They're addictive to both customers and to laborers. And then in terms of merchants and restaurants, while they may not be addictive, they're highly predatory. So right, once they right. get those hooks in with a with the contract, it's very, very difficult to get those hooks out. And they had a real good selling point when they when they convinced all these poor suckers in businesses that were suffering during a pandemic that the way out was was delivery to delivery. their customers. Yeah. Yeah. But the problem is they that these gig apps are fighting an eternity of history prior to the pandemic in which uh, for the United States, 99% of retailers and 85% of restaurants, which is pretty much everybody but pizza places, did right. not have delivery to their customers prior to the pandemic. Yeah. Right. So delivery markets and DoorDash knew this when they were starting up with the Y Combinator out of Stanford. I mean, they had a, an AI scam from the start, but right. even they knew their AI scam was tailored toward high income, dense, dense uh, localities. They right. knew that this was a market, you know, that was that was for St. Louis and for New York City <laughs> and for Los Angeles and for San Francisco and that. They needed certain demographics to make this thing fought. Yep, yep. Now today, how is this developed? Well, no longer is it about certain demographics. They've peanut buttered this thing around every small town and suburban community in the U.S. because it's no longer about delivery. Yeah. DoorDash is losing more money today per delivery than any other time in the last 10 years. So here's that, here's that question you ask, right? So if DoorDash, the market leader at 65%, is losing more money today per delivery than at any time in the last 10 years, then how are they then why how are they still are, going? Yeah. There's there's two reasons. When you're when you're losing money like like corporations do, and uh, that's yeah, yeah, and investors yeah. like SoftBank and they expect this now, you're buying and monopolizing markets, right? They're yeah. subsidizing the price, these highly discounted prices that they're giving to consumers to to suck them in, they're subsidizing this with a loss from the corporation. Yeah. How long can corporations lose money? I don't know. Amazon became um, yeah. the 
Amazon became the first corporation to lose over a trillion dollars in market cap, which is the number of shares outstanding times the market price. So they, they're the first corporation in humanity to lose a trillion dollars of market value. Now, market value, since we're not selling yeah. Amazon, market value is not really the most important metric. It's more of kind of a, a funny anecdote. But they are losing money, and yep. losing money is, is, you know, that's in the red with either the parentheses or it's got a negative sign, whatever. However you, you do the loss, they're losing. So what are they gaining with that loss? Well, in, in DoorDash, which I consider by far the technological leader as well as the market leader, they now have 27 nations in DoorDash. They acquired wow. Bolt Enterprises, which is out of, uh, why can I not remember? Uh, Sweden? I think. Okay. Anyway, Bolt, W-O-L-T. They acquired, acquired Bolt during the pandemic, which added 23 more nations <laughs> to, their, to their little app slavery campaign. Wow. And that's, so app colonization and I made up. I had to make up a new vocabulary for this stuff because it didn't exist. <laughs> right? App, app colonization and app slavery is the long game. DoorDash takes a percentage of economic activity without any capital investment and with no employees. Mm -hmm. So take that to the next step. What would you do? Is you could ex enslave any corporate workforce, any local workforce, any national workforce anywhere in the world with this technology, and that yeah. is the long game that they're playing that, of course, they don't want anyone to know. Nobody else even talks about. Right, that right. The game they're playing. They are losing money because once they get DoorDash AI in place, whether it's a corporate-owned scenario or whether it's a gig app type scenario, it doesn't even matter. Right. Because once that AI is running the humans for exploitation and profit maximization, it's all over. And unfortunately, for the gig economy, it's all over. The only thing that can be done now is to kill it and burn it with fire. That's it. There is no way, there is no way, there's no way to reform the gig economy. You can't game right. a game. You can't go in and fix Call of Duty so that, you know, so, so, that, so that the good guys win. I mean, it's a game. Right. It, it's, yeah. It's, it's, there's, it's there's intentionally no set up this way. So it's, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Like I, I think about like how how th they really got lucky with the pandemic, right? Like <laughs> they would have been like uh, our local government. I I don't know if you've heard of uh, the Canadian company Skip the Dishes. I have not. It's it's like DoorDash, but it's from Canada, and it was developed in Saskatchewan, where I'm from. And our provincial they say government a boot instead of about that's the difference. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and our provincial government, Saskatchewan's government, actually invested in it, and oh. <laughs> and like the owners, like it's very, it's it's uh, essentially it's DoorDash from Canada, <laughs> but uh, but it's 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 interesting, like that the government would invest in this you know, not ever thinking about how the long-term effects of it. And then also like they've expanded there all the way throughout Canada or what have you, but they different provinces had to put new rules in place so that they couldn't charge restaurants as much, but then they didn't put any protections in for the workers. <laughs> so they just, you know, charge more and take less, more out of the pocket of the driver. and like. Right. It's, it's whack-a-mole. If you, if you whack it down one place, it pops up in another that's place. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's the nature of these game worlds. So they did the same thing in the United States where San Francisco or somebody put in a cap on what, what DoorDash could charge in terms of, you know, X, they called it, whatever fees they were calling it. And so, I mean, DoorDash went back and they put in a San Francisco fee. I mean, they just like <laughs> a complete, you know, F you to your face because well, you didn't say you didn't say it couldn't be called this. I mean, again, so this yep. is uh, these are the limits of 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 human systems, whether they be politicians or whether they be bureaucracies to contain a simulation in a game world. Is that they don't they don't work? They can't work. They can't keep up, <laughs> right? Because we go back to those two impossibility, those two paired impossibility scenarios, right? How can a politician or a government regulate something they, they don't understand and they can't understand? That's it makes me think of uh, the guys in Congress or what have you. They're arguing with Je uh, what's his name from Meta, Facebook guy. Right. 
And they're like, well, what about this and this and this? And they have no idea what they're actually talking about. And he's just like, well, sir, we're going to, this is what we're actually doing. And that's not how that works. And you want to talk about, you want to talk about some connections if you want to get really scared. Okay. So we know SoftBank was behind a huge amount of the WeWork debacle. Mm -hmm. SoftBank's a huge uh, investor in uh, Uber. With, with, Saudi, with, <laughs> with Saudi Arabian money and massive Chinese operations. And they're a major investor in DoorDash. Now, DoorDash's CEO, Tony Hsu, is now on the board of directors for Meta. So he's a good pal of Mark Zuckerberg, right? So you got uh-huh. in there. So, I mean, you want to talk about an evil empire of, of connections here. Yeah, no kidding. Be terrified if people thought that Meta was bad. People thought that 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 Facebook was uh, was a, a, a existential threat to humanity. Somehow, get into your head that now Tony Hsu and DoorDash are partnered with Meta, and they want to sell you Door. They want to have DoorDash delivery in the metaverse. And they want to have people employed in the metaverse <laughs> to give you, you know, to give you metaverse customer yeah. support, uh, so that you can go to Snoop Dogg's show and get your DoorDash delivered to your virtual seat. I don't know, man. Yeah, this is well, yeah, that's that shit. But these, these, I mean, Saudi Arabia, China, SoftBank, Meta, DoorDash, Uber. I mean, are you waiting for Satan to pop up and go, I'm the new CEO? I mean, what else could you possibly want in terms of in terms of societal, economic, corporate evil involved in this in this triad? And they're all colluding. They're all colluding with every government in the world to make right. the gig economy the standard. And the gig economy, make no mistake about it, is the end of human labor and human employment as we know it. Yeah, like I, I often like uh, I think of like the idea of, I mean, maybe there wouldn't be some industries that could adopt it in the same way, but you think about managers and how ma- bad managers are at managing just the workers, right? Uh, keeping track of what needs to be done and what have you usually has to be done by on the ground workers anyway. And then you take like a human out of that and you go, <laughs> well, we're just going to insert a program into, into this place. <laughs> And it's going to somehow track everything and and know everything that it needs to know to adapt to whatever circumstances. It just doesn't make any sense, like that well, it would actually a, work. There's a couple really important points about what you just said. Number one, when you get to that level of AI management, quality and integrity and service no longer make play any part in the transaction. They are skimming right. a percentage of total receipts. Thus, organizing AI entity has no concern for training or competency or safety or value or anything yeah. else. It just becomes the psychopath's you know, monolithic profit motive. So when you're a consumer and you want customer service, doesn't exist anymore. If you're a laborer right. and you want customer service, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it might exist for merchants and restaurants while the independents are still alive because they they want your bigger share of the money. But there's a huge problem is that by design, gig app laborers are not trained, not supported, not funded. Uh, yeah. They're ubiquitous drones, which will be hired and fired without any human recourse or concern whatsoever. Now, let's yeah. take that the next level of people that aren't gig app workers We are already getting screwed today because AI is screening every resume you ever send in through Mm. the internet. AI is is sorting out the resumes that a human will ever see. AI is even being used. Last week, there was just an article out that 98% of the HR executives old said they either are or will use AI for termination decisions. What? Yeah, yeah. This is great stuff. Man. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah. Oh well, my God. Sorry. So it's okay. One, it's terrible. Two, it's been happening for a number of years now, and nobody's told you. Yeah, I suppose. 
So if you want to know why a 50-year-old uh, person with a master's in business from Duke and 25 years of experience can't get hired, it's because no human ever sees my resume. Right, right. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether, you know, it, it, that's not the profile that they want. They want yeah. young, cheap, and inexperienced to be used. Right? Yeah. They don't want that's right. somebody that's going to put up a fight. And uh, <laughs> to... to the, the race to the bottom for all of humanity and all of labor is tied to this development of AI in the gig economy. And it's, and it's corporate AI, to be specific. Let's not just call it AI. This is right. corporate AI that was developed by corporations explicitly and only to exploit humans and human markets. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it was invented. So if you think that the chess computer that was invented to beat the chess masters is going to decide to lose to your six-year-old because it's nice. That's not the case. It's going to beat <laughs> your six-year-old. It's going to beat your grandma, and it will beat the grandmaster too. It doesn't care. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and uh, you can see that, like, like you say, the apps they don't care if the driver is making enough money that day. They just care if it works for the system. Or no, let's be, let's be explicit. The gig economy has been built upon coercive AI gamification and gamblification where they can force or coerce, same thing really, impoverished laborers to lose money on individual contracts, which is by definition slavery. So, so this system has already been designed to enslave humans with the idea that if you do slavery for this individual contract, then on a future individual contract, I'm going to give you some net income. Yeah, that's that's not <laughs> really legitimate. Number one, and number two, even if it was an or even if this was an organic market, even if this was tied to the real world that we know and understand, every single gig app from Uber to DoorDash to Grubhub, you name it, withholds material information when they try to get the independent contractor to agree or decline this contract. So it's not a legitimate contract. I can't sell you a car and right. then run away and you get in and turn the key and there's no engine inside. <laughs> right. I, I withheld material information from you that when you turn the key, there's no engine and nothing's going to happen. So yeah. that's not a legitimate car sale. You're going to come back to me. And so what these guys do, so for Uber, for example, they dole out these, these, these rides and I'm no Uber expert, but they don't tell the person where they're going or where they're driving to because they know that a rational human would be going like, I'm not going there. That's where people get shot after midnight, number one. So humans right. would discriminate against where they go and, and what they do. And number two, humans would go, wait a minute, that's a bad economic offer. That's going to send me way over here where I don't want to go. So because their offers, if fully disclosed, would be turned down, they have determined in this world with no rules that they can just <laughs> they can just withhold material information. The yeah. problem is that when we step back out of the gig economy, the rules of a contract in the real world say that you have to materially you have to disclose material information. So it is clearly my argument within the book and right here with you today that there is not a single contract signed with a gig economy company from a independent contractor agreement with a laborer to a consumer that agrees to some program to a restaurant or a merchant. There's not a single one of those contracts that is legitimate and that should not be uh, yeah. dissolved immediately because it's all fraud. It is, yeah. it is fraud and it can't be anything else. You just that, can't be. <laughs> that, uh, that actually really nails, uh, why, like, I found that I couldn't make a living on the gig on the using the gig economy apps because you would have it like for DoorDash, I think, or it was maybe it was Skip the Dishes. They had where it would come up and it would say approximately two kilometers away, yeah, you. <laughs> and I would drive twelve kilometers to get to the restaurant, and then I still got to drive another six to the delivery, and you go. How was that two kilometers or one point, you know, whatever kilometers? How can I do that for five dollars? Like I can't do that trip for five dollars. It just didn't make any sense. Well, and so so you could say, so people people use this term glitch, 
a lot of, oh, a lot yeah. of gig hours. Well, that's <laughs> a, is that a glitch? There's no such thing as a glitch. There is 10,000 data scientists and system developers that make sure that that glitch never happens. Right. That is on purpose. And, and so, so, for example, with DoorDash, they, every single offer is an unsolvable equation. Even if you knew your hourly expenses of what it costs you, what your what your gas, what your what your depreciation on your vehicle is, even if you knew every single metric in right. every offer, they they fail to give you the information that would allow you to logically solve whether you're profitable on any given offer or not. Yeah. So so yeah. I think you could easily argue that a corporation doling out unsolvable equations as independent contracts is committing fraud. It, right. Yes. Yeah. It's intentionally it misleading. So, so, so how did our legislators and our regulators sleep on this when it's that profound? How does the how does the Canadian municipal uh, government sleep on this when it's so profound? And I would just say it's it's back to this new paradigm. Mm-hmm. I don't think they even understand what they're actually doing because they're not processing the power of AI managing human activity relative to a human. Uh, yeah. You know, back, back to this, back to this check, chess game, right? Chess has been solved by AI, period, end of story. There yeah. is no move a human can make in chess that can beat an AI computer. It's been solved. Right. So put that, that same equation into the gig economy and you can see how nothing but exploitation can ever happen. It is inherent in the system that was designed by corporations. And I'll give you another another parallel because I think it's a really interesting thing that we can go into. In psychology, as it was developing, particularly in the 50s and the 60s, psychological experiments were run on human beings that could no longer be run today because Mm -hmm. we found out, they found out, that those psychological experiments did present and permanent damage to the humans yeah. participating in the experiment. And we said to ourselves, that's not the concept of psychology. Like this is this is a Hippocratic oath type scenario where first we must not do harm to our subjects right. you know, to say that the outputs of this study are going to be valid and useful. So one great example of that is the Stanford prison experiment in which yeah. they took students and they they randomly uh, assigned them roles of either being a prisoner or a prison guard. And I think that experiment lasted less than 24 hours before they had to cut it off because it was so dysfunctional and people on both uh, the guard uh, group <laughs> and people in the prisoner group were literally losing their, their minds and sanity. And, right. And, and doing this. And so that was that's one great thing. And, and it's illuminating about basically American policing, our prison industrial complex, you name it. Read about the yep. Stanford. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, <clears throat> And then there's the Milgram experiment uh, in which they put a human in a chair and I think they introduced them to a friendly face that was going to go into the other room, an actor. And they went in the other room and they sat him in front of a dial and they said, here's a dial. And so if you turn it up to one, it's going to cause like, you know, a minor tingling in this subject. And at number three, it's going to cause, you know, this this slightly painful sensation. At five, it's going to become very painful. You know, at, at 10, it could be lethal. It could be legal. right. So, and then they they start assigning these people tasks, and they get these people who believe that they are that they are distributing uh, electrical voltage to a human being in another room. And I think you know, for good measure, I think they they put some human yelps and and screams and stuff in there. Yeah. As as the uh, as the as the electricity got dialed up, and they were able to convince people to dole out potentially lethal doses of electric shock <laughs> to this subject because they were told to, because yeah. they were in the experiment yeah. and somebody said you should. And so imagine the damage when they come, you know, you think you just possibly gave somebody the electric chair and then you come out and they go, hey, it was just a joke. Yeah, that's, you might <laughs> you have an existential crisis to deal with. Yeah, that's right. You killed somebody and then maybe so it turns you out, Yeah, turns out I'm the kind of person who does this. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out I'm a psychopath. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is this is extraordinarily analogous to where we are with AI today. Right. Is that 
with AI today, you've got systems engineers and data engineers that work in DoorDash in the Bay Area who are willing to dole out these lethal shocks to humanity because they're being told to do so. Are they evil people? Most of them are young immigrants from China and India and lots of other places yeah. uh, on pieces. And I have a theory about you know abuse and uh, control of bringing people in on visas versus a native workforce. We can debate uh, that one later. But you know these people, do they know that they're creating societal nukes that are going to kill humanity? I don't know. I think a lot of them believe the believe the propaganda that they're given that they're right. creating something great and amazing, and they're also twenty two to twenty eight years old and don't know shit. Right. <laughs> no yeah. offense to twenty two to twenty eight years old, which is the ages of my two kids. Right. <laughs> they, <laughs> they just they don't understand yeah. what they're doing by creating this monster. So, so to step back and say kill it and burn it with fire is not irrational any more than saying that we can't do Milgram and Stanford experiments on college students right. in 23. It's yeah. not humane. Yeah, it's just not. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a system, like you say, of essentially it's enslavement. So maybe we shouldn't, we should look at the ethics of this instead of just, you know, going with the tech instead. Yeah. Not only are they not looking at the ethics, they're not even looking at the outputs. Right. right. They're, they're, they're accepting the outputs as some version of fact or some version of legitimacy mm. when they're nothing of, of the sort. So all of the credibility that's been given to the gig economy by billions and trillions of dollars of transactions is, is false. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I mean, like you say, these companies, like, I, I don't know if it was Uber, the first three years that I was like doing part-time Uber, there was, they were losing money every year. Yeah, still and, are. And, <laughs> and you go, well, how can this work? Well, they're spend, they're just expanding the market, expanding the market. At some mm. point you're in every market. How, how, where does this go from there? So, so think about, let's, let's think about SoftBank in particular. Okay. Can you imagine that SoftBank even cares what their, what their, uh, account is at any given day. <laughs> it's going to go up and down and whatever. Is, yeah. it, is it four trillion and three dollars, or is it three trillion yeah. nine thousand nine hundred nine? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's so big, it's right. incomprehensible. It, it, it's irrelevant. This is a play for the monopolization on human enslavement via AI. Mm. That's that's what this is, and there. There's no doubt about it. Lyft's about to go out of business. Lyft, Lyft is going to go bankrupt. And by the way, nobody wants that piece of shit. Right? Right. They, would, would, would DoorDash buy a company that hauls around human beings? No. I mean, DoorDash's secret power at 65% is they don't haul human beings around. They don't yeah. have to deal with the liability that Uber and Lyft carry around. They're dealing with packages, which means their standards are so low that if anything happens, it doesn't matter because, yeah. you know, you can lose. They, they can have an untrained person spill the drinks and poorly deliver some food. And it, it doesn't make any difference. You know, Uber and Lyft, when when their drivers crash or when their drivers attack uh, yeah. or get attacked by a customer, which is more likely. Like, it really it, matters. Those, yeah. those, are, issues. those, are, those yeah. are human issues. And so. The ultimate enslavement is really through these last mile delivery type apps like like DoorDash is doing and like DoorDash is deploying now to private businesses where you can just manage humans directly and not worry about their cargo because the cargo is a pain in the ass. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So instead, you can just send them to do a thing. <laughs> yeah. Send, send yeah. them to do a thing. Anything. Now, what, what are the things that they could do? They could go take pictures for surveillance of a grocery store. You just send a right. dasher out, take a picture of this shelf. And now I know, is this grocery store following the rules of our merchandising agreement or are they not? So right. any DoorDash driver can now be a spy. Now, DoorDash drivers can move drugs for you because now they have peer-to-peer -peer delivery. So you can just have DoorDash driver pick up the package. Any package from the house. Yeah. And they'll go deliver it to another person's house and you just sent <laughs> one side of the city to the other with no risk whatsoever. 
So who's who's yeah? So who exactly holds the liability there if the driver gets busted with a pound of cocaine? Well, so so Uber was already publicly called out for moving drugs. I believe it was in California. Okay. In so this is this is not this is not an unprecedented <laughs> scenario. But again, Uber traditionally and systemically involves hauling around humans. Take it to the DoorDash level, which I consider to be a a much more powerful. Right. Uh, engine for exploiting human beings, now you don't even have any any human trackability or accountability, right? And and the beauty of DoorDash, right, is they don't even know their labor. Right. They don't employ them. They don't service them. They don't give them customer support. They don't pay them. They don't answer the phone if they've got problems. They don't <laughs> know them. So if any yeah. given dasher lives or dies or anything else, DoorDash, yeah. who? Wait, yeah. they, don't, they don't employ any humans in the field. None. Zero zip. What a great, what a great <laughs> play at, wow. at, uh, at taking corporate accountability and making it disappear. No kidding. Because what can't you do in that scenario without plausible deniability? Well, I didn't, I didn't know the guy was hauling cocaine. We thought he was hauling, <laughs> you know, we thought he was hauling dog toys. Right. Yeah. Our, our issue. Yeah. Right. So whose issue is it if if all of these corporations that have been polluting and destroying our world and decreasing the wages for labor and everything else, if now they have plausible deniability on all their operations, then right. What? Yeah. So who's well, we know what then what that's called the free rider syndrome. It all goes on society. Then you pay for it, I pay for it, everybody listening to this podcast. It makes me think of like uh like Nesty or or maybe it wasn't Nesty, but one of those those companies that do chocolate in South, uh, in South America or wherever it is right. and how they have private contractors that do the harvesting. And those private contractors happen to use slave labor right. and child slave labor. And, but Nestle has no liability for it in the United States because it's a private right. contractor. I have no connection to this. Right. And this is right. So this, this game of connect the dots where we caught, you know, where we caught some, some different uh, movie star or another endorsing products that were made by by child labor or Apple iPhones <laughs> that, are being, yeah. that are being manufactured where they put nets around the factory so the workers that want to jump out the window to kill themselves can't do it effectively. Right, right. Like those those type of really cool labor scenarios. Yeah, man. So take that out. Add the plausible deniability. Well, and yeah. so let's talk about let's talk about something that's going to hit near and dear right now. So. Drunk driving took a real toll on the world as as cars became more commonplace and and filled our roads. Yep. And mothers that didn't drunk driving came out and they started campaigns and TV campaigns and the police forces and municipalities jumped in. So who's who's talking about the fact that drivers are all over our our streets now, 24 hours a day with three or four different phones, managing three or four different apps that are all giving them notifications and demanding that they interact while they're driving around our streets and yeah. that they're killing themselves, killing other people, getting in wrecks, destroying yeah. uh, our, our roads and infrastructure for corporate profit. And, and again, and nobody knows them, right? They're not employed by anybody. They're contractors. They're independent contractors. Yeah. yeah. So, so, Sooner or later, the insurance industry, or maybe just people that don't want their loved ones to die by gig app laborers, are going to start to smoke out the fact that that this is insane. This yeah. is not a system that is sustainable from a human and societal perspective. Because if you look at the accidents, and you can you can look at my uh, at my book or or my Twitter or or whatever uh, mediums you digest my work and see. These are not isolated circumstances, and yeah. the liability that these gig economy companies take in part is a joke, right? They'll 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 be liable for some small portion of an entire day that a gig app worker is driving around, right? And now, if you've got any given gig app worker working two, three, four, five different gig apps at a time, how would you even know if it's Uber or DoorDash? That caused them to crash the car and right. kill your kid. Yeah, I, I don't know. know. Yeah, you can't. The, the notifications are going off all over the place. Is it Uber that killed my kid, or is it DoorDash that killed my kid? Does it matter? Right, 
right? At some point, it's just got to be the gig economy is now responsible, right? Right. But- and, and so, so you say, well, is this a technical problem? No, it's not a technical problem. <laughs> Android, Android, and iPhone both have the technology built into their app design platforms to turn off notifications while the while a vehicle is in motion. Your your smartphone is able to tell if yep. you're in a car moving or not and is able to silence notifications. But if they did that, it would break the system, right? Yep. If they did not give notifications that endangered human life, their profitability would go down. And just like the companies that manufactured our opioids, are they willing to have a whole bunch of people die and pay a billion dollar fine for profit? Yeah, that's, that's, yeah that's, they that's will. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, 100%. That's a good, solid economic corporate decision. So right now, they're choosing their attempts at uh, profitability, but mostly their play for monopolization of, of global app slaves versus your life. Yeah. That's the calculation they made. If that's cool with you, order lunch from DoorDash today. <laughs> that's, it, that's, it, the plug. that's the best plug <laughs> ever for DoorDash. If you want to kill people, yeah. order DoorDash today. Right, eh? I, uh, it reminds me cause we often, you know, like we often talk about the danger of truck drivers driving, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, oh, yeah. you know, and how tired they get and how we have to really, we have to regulate this industry and really have to, but when every driver is doing that now, like you've got however many other drivers that they're not, maybe not, they're, they're not driving big rigs, but they're driving various different sizes of vehicles. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. There's a hell of a lot more of them and they're not trained at all. Truck drivers are professional drivers. That's right. They know their ass is on the line because they're hauling a big rig with a big load and they know lives are on the line. Yeah. These drivers out there, remember they could be on their first shift ever with DoorDash when they're driving off the road. And many of them are right. The less experienced they are. And, and there's, this is constant turnover, right? This constant churn of using humanity and throwing them out, right? You do it for six months. I do it for six months. The other person does it for six months. So they keep changing us over, which means we can never organize. We can never figure out which end is up. We can never really get trained and never really coalesce into anything, but a, but an individual little slave laborer that's by design. But you nailed a really important point, which any review of the gig economy will show you is that there are people out there because there are no regulations that are working seven days a week that are driving 16 hour days. And I've done it myself. I had to take, I, I, during the, during the pandemic, when I was desperate to get income going, I think I did like 21 straight days of DoorDash in a row before I realized I was going to kill myself or somebody else imminently. Right. Right. And so there are no standards, right? And and when you combine desperation with no standards, you get lots of stories. One of the folks that I interviewed for my podcast, uh, Dennis, uh, calls himself the rideshare hustler. He used to sleep in his car yeah. because it was easier just to turn on his phone at 7 a.m. and start working. So do studies about how sharp any of us are in the first three minutes after we wake up for driving we're all drunk drivers, right? Yeah. If you just go hop in your car three minutes after waking, you are a drunk driver. You're yeah, drunk I used to, when I did Uber, uh, like at the start, it was, there was so few drivers in the city and I was, so I was busy. So I was like making decent money right. off of it. And I would go home and I would sleep and have the app on and then it would go off. I'd get up, I'd go get in my car, I'd drive, <laughs> take somebody and then go home. like it's, it. And you can feel it when you're doing it. You can feel how dangerous it is when and you're in, in the car and you're going, like, I probably shouldn't be driving right now. I shouldn't be picking somebody up. Like I shouldn't be responsible for another person at all. Right. <laughs> so, right. but there, like you say, there's no rules, right? There's no limit on that. There are no rules. And individual apps have said over time, I don't think any of them are enforcing it. And they change their rules so frequently you wouldn't know. But there were individual apps that I think said that they wouldn't allow more than 60 hours in a week or something like that. <laughs> but in the day when you're using five different apps, what difference does it make? Yeah, I mean, if people right. are spending 13 hours on each app, it adds up to 70 hours in a week and none of them you know, crossed a barrier. So yeah. again, our previous regulations and rules that that provided safety for the general public from us yeah those are gone. They just don't apply they just don't apply and and 
really, really terrible things happen. And, and so, as you said, you know, we, we wake up, we get out there. One of the things that we need to step back from real fast is the respect that comes to gig economy laborers. And I want to make a real point here. This is a workforce that has been around forever, mm -hmm. was around before gig apps, and will be around after gig apps. If gig apps disappeared today, this labor force would still be here, be ready to work, be able to work, and be competent at working. So yep. this global grift that's going on provides nothing for anyone. It's a yep. freaking Ponzi scheme. It's a lie. It's a scam where the oligarchs are destroying the last vestiges of labor security and labor empowerment. So, so when we, when we look at the workers, we have to recognize just like you, just like me, and just like all these people out there today, they want to support their families. They want to eat. They want to have a roof over their head. Sometimes yeah. even if they know they're being abused by corporate AI, they still have to do it because they still got to make sure they have a roof over their kid's head and they have yep. food to eat. So, so once you get this system in place and you get these people dependent, you get people like us dependent upon it, and we are hard workers and we are motivated and we do have goals and we do have families and needs, then yep. we're really trapped. Because you know as well as I do, if you're driving around five, six days a week, you're exhausted when you're done. You have yep. no time to look for another job. You have no right. time to spend doing anything else. You work and you sleep. Yep. So, so the disparagement of low skilled, if you will, and I'm, I'm going to put it in quotes because right. I don't think that people are actually low skilled. I think people are, by definition, highly skilled. But, but the traditional category of low skilled or low wage labor has been maligned much too long and much too terribly, because what I see is that the gig economy has actually proved the opposite. It's proved that there are millions and millions and millions upon millions of people around the world that are desperate to work and that yeah. only need an opportunity. And what did we provide them? We provided them the opportunity for gig app enslavement, not a real job. Right. So I think this is, this is back to who's holding the accountability here. It's, it's the governments of the world. It's our regulars, it's our politicians, all of whom are too behind the curve of modern society and technology and humanity to even understand how deficient they are. Because I'm going to come back to it. This labor force will exist after yeah. the gig economy goes away. And it will go away. It, it does not have sustainability. It will either consume us and end us or it will right. be gone. Yeah. Well, we're at an hour. So uh, is there anything that we should touch on that we haven't covered yet? Oh gosh, we could <laughs> live here, and it's been it's been a lot of fun. No, I think I think that this is really it. I guess the thing that I would say, as as I guess a plug for my work, if you will, and this isn't none of this is about me or you or anybody else. This is this is about humanity. No, for a fact that just like gig apps, Google and Twitter and any other media platform is suppressing the message of full dash closure. It's suppressing the distribution of full dash closure because what full dash closure does, in my opinion, more definitively than anybody else's work right now, is expose the gig economy and the corporatocracy for what it is and expose this monopolization, monopolization scheme right. for global app slavery and global app colonization. So if I had any plea to the audience, it would be share this work with people that you know that are in the gig economy to share this work with people that you know that patronize the gig economy or that use their restaurant or uh or business to support the gig economy right this is a toxic toxic addition to society and you can help beat it by making sure that google and twitter and all the other platforms that want to suppress this message don't succeed because I can assure you by the numbers and it's very easy, just like the gig economy can study numbers. I can study numbers. It's very easy to see how they're suppressing the full dash closure. So right. please share this work and share these thoughts. More importantly, whether you share the work or not 
of right. what the economy is in reality, because people have to know this. Your leaders will not save you from this. They're not capable of it. And, I, and that's yeah. very, very sad and scary, but they're not capable of saving us from this menace. Well, I guess uh, I have a whole bunch of links for you, but uh, where's the best place for people to find you and your content? Uh, Jeff Thomas Black, full dash closure on Substack. If you Perfect. put in any of any of those uh, any combination of those words, you'll you'll find me. And awesome. I appreciate it very much. I really enjoy your work, Corey, and I hope we'll get a chance to talk again. For sure. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. All right, that's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me survive, which is essentially the only way that projects like this can continue for me. If you want to contribute, you can do that at uh, patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical left. If you can't contribute financially, then a, a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check the show notes for links to all my stuff and to check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. There you can find the videos I do with my friend Damien Marie Athope, and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast, Skeptarchy, and from my newly retired show, From, Ma from Many People's Strength. You can also find links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. You can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at skepticallefty. My Facebook page is the Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. And my mastodon is collectiva.social slash at skeptical leftist. Thanks so much for listening and or watching and make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Uh, join your local org, print off some posters and pamphlets and uh, spread the propaganda.